What's up, ladies and gentlemen of the internet? It's your boy, Jack Slack. Fights Gone By podcast, episode 113. Coming at you on Tuesday the 15th of January. And sipping from my comically large mug of Earl Grey tea. Two tea bags, that's how big this mug is. In fact, if you haven't been keeping up with the YouTube channel, I just put up a preview from, um, what was it, a couple of months ago? The history episode, uh, An All-Consuming Need for Tea, the first of three episodes on uh, Britain in China. But anyway, uh, I've been sort of like twiddling my thumbs, just waiting for fights to start up again. Um, really boring time of year, because we tend to pack out the year towards the end of December. UFC like to get two pay-per-views in in December, uh, and then there's obviously Ryzen does like a, a two-night thing normally. Uh, their first night really wasn't that special this year, but uh, was it last year that they did the, the whole tournament? They did they had Kyoji fight on one night and then the final on the, on the second night? I can't remember, but the, yeah, Ryzen tend to really pack things in around New Year's Eve. So you get this ultra hype towards the end of the year as you're getting less and less time to write about things and you're having to escape from rooms with your family to check on your phone how various things are going on uh, and, and who's failed drug tests. <clears throat> um, and then January starts and there's fucking nothing. <laughs> like, you're just waiting forever. Um, but they do tend to pay off though because uh, was it TJ versus Dom was in January? I remember that one. Um, RDA versus... Cerrone, I seem to remember that was a January fight. They tend to be good when they get here. Not that the time of the year actually matters at all, but this this card's looking pretty good, the, the upcoming UFC one. There's some stuff going on with one uh, across... I was going to say across the pond. Across multiple ponds and large areas of land. Um, but yeah, we're back into it, and it's, it's a pretty good card coming up. So let's do some news before we uh, get into previews. Um, I suppose it's news, but the UFC are teasing a new belt. Uh, I've always liked the design of the UFC belts, but I suppose, you know, change is never a bad thing. Uh, the, the WWE do a good job of bringing out interesting belt designs. Um, I suppose that's the thing. If you're a, a belt designer, and they do exist out there in the world, if you're a belt designer, you don't get an awful lot of opportunities to show off your new ideas. So it's quite fun when the WWE unveil, like, their Raw title or their Undisputed title or their... Uh, new women's title, not the Divas title, which was the butterfly belt. One thing I do really like about the WWE's way of doing it is that everyone gets their own side plates, which are like something about them, you know, just represented in on the belt. Um, UFC don't do that, sadly. But then, to be fair, most UFC fighters don't have their own logo or anything. You know, if Cubs wants to ever want a UFC belt, and, and we're getting towards a sore spot there for me, but um, he could have his killer Cub thing on there. But... Or Anderson Silva could have his spider with the gloves. But I think he ditched that because it was kind of crap. But yeah, uh, so, so the UFC have only really teased it. They just showed like the top edge of it with some diamonds or cubic zirconians or whatever they are uh, embedded in it. You sort of forget it when you're watching, but guys get a belt every time they defend their belt. So, <laughs> you know, so people like Demetrius Johnson have 12 or whatever. Um, George St. Pierre famously gave away, I think, all of his but the first one. He gave um, Firas the one that he won uh, against Jake Shields in Canada. Uh, and he, he made it a really big thing, like something meaningful to him. But there was a great clip. I think it was Benson Henderson, Frankie Edgar. Uh, it was certainly one that Benson Henderson won, but there was it was those UFC blogs that Dana White used to do or, or uh, something similar. And they just showed Dana White feeling this belt and going, I'm embarrassed to put this on him because it was, it was still sharp. Like he was terrified someone was going to cut themselves on it. Um, anyway, enough talk about belts, but I thought that was interesting. Uh, expect people to be butthurt either way, even if it looks really good. My guess would be they're going to go with a flatter, squarer design, uh, with the letters imprinted in rather than popping out. Because uh, it's kind of hard to make out UFC on the belt sometimes when they're uh, moving around in the cage. But then, do you, to be fair, when do you ever see the belt? You only really see it at the end of the fight. Most guys don't come to the ring with it. Uh, 1FC got a Tokyo TV deal, which is big. Uh, and Genki Sudo is possibly coming on board as commentator, which is awesome. He's moved himself into sort of a Joe Rogan position over there. Um, because if you don't know, New... Uh, is it New Order? No, not New Order. Yeah, New... No, wait, no, they did Blue Monday. Whatever the name of his band, they're really popular over there. They, uh, they all wear suits and they do amazing dance routines. And you can't go down a road in Tokyo without seeing, like, a bus or something with them on the side of it. Um, so he's a pretty big deal over there. Uh... And he did sort of retire too soon, which is really sad, you know, because he was fucking electric in the ring, Genki Sudo. Now, there are very few people, 
Well, there's never been anyone who does it like him, but like there are very few people you can go, wow, that's just so different when they're fighting. It was a real shame that he's not been like drafted into doing um, some submission grappling or something like that, like a um, quintet, because he used to uh, train down Carpe Diem, uh, which is one of the big gyms in Tokyo. And I think they win the local quintet thing, or the one that wasn't like all the international stars. Um, and I think he was coaching wrestling for Takahoku University at one point. Uh, so he's still actively involved in the grappling scene. It would be interesting to see him grappling. On the subject of competitive grappling, AJ Agazam has uh, set his uh, Bellator debut or uh, Bellator, Be- uh, Bellator Bellator 214. He's fighting some schlub. You don't need to know who he's fighting. Um, but AJ is an interesting character because he's a totally whiny douche who everyone in the jiu-jitsu community hates. But he does, like, if you watch any training footage in any of the major gyms, like when they're warming up to the ADCC or anything like that, uh, he's there. Like He's like Jake Shields. He's ubiquitous in the grappling world. And like Jake Shields, he gets in a, a lot of trouble because of his beefs with people and, and uh, fouling. Mind you, we've recast Jake Shields as not an eye-poking, drug-using cheat in recent years because he's been matched against people who we hate more, like Paul Harris and Dylan Dennis. And AJ. But yeah, expect AJ to win that uh, easily because there is a certain level where while he did sort of fluke his way through to the semi-finals of ADCC this year, um, there's a level where if you're good enough at grappling, like low-level MMA guys are not going to be able to handle you. Unless he you know, makes the mistake of trying to strike with this dude and gets knocked out, which would be hilarious. And obviously that's why everyone will tune in. Same with Dylan Dennis. I wish people would stop caring about Dylan Dennis, um, but they won't. This one, this piece of news really bummed me out um, because like, I was going down the card earlier this week trying to get you know ready for uh, stuff. It wasn't earlier this week, last week. Uh, trying to get ready and say, what should I write about? And I thought, John Lineker versus Corey Sandhagen. That's a, that's a pretty good fight. And then I was thinking, Glover Teixeira versus Ion Kutalaba. Now that's a good fight. And then on the same afternoon, news dropped that John Lineker and Glover Teixeira were both out of those fights. So now John Lineker's fighting, sorry, um, Corey Sandhagen's fighting someone... I can't remember who, and they were still trying to find someone to fight Ion Kutalaba last time I saw. Um, finding a, a light heavyweight at short notice, good luck with that. Uh, call on the middleweights. Tiago Santos will do it. But, yeah, that's a real bummer, because those were two of the really good fights on this card I was looking at and thinking, there's no way that'll be a dull one. A uh, little bit of uh, number reporting. UFC 232, Jones versus Gustafsson, uh, Cyborg versus Nunes, uh, reportedly did 700,000 buys, which puts it at, I think, second or third this year. Well, actually, no, it doesn't. Wait. Yeah, it was December. So that's like second, third territory. Um, obviously, they did their biggest PPV ever last year with uh, Habib versus Connor. Um, but yeah, I mean, Jones was always reliably a draw, uh, and Cyborg was also reliably pretty well a draw. Um, kind of sad though that 700,000 people paid for that and only 200,000 or whatever, 300,000 paid for Holloway. But Holloway's working his way up in the world. He's getting a name now. Uh, people are starting to tune in more, which is great. Uh, more Bellator news. Rafael Lovato Jr. has been taken off the Bellator 214 card because he was set to fight Gegard Mousasi in what was a fairly intriguing fight. Um, Rafael Lovato is basically the only other guy in the middleweight division worth caring about. Um, I don't think he's fought anyone particularly good. But he is interesting nonetheless because he's a smothering grappler, um, and you know he could. They, there was a chance that he could do what Jacare did to Musasi because Musasi's takedown defense isn't the greatest, um, and his bottom game is often just guard and up kicks. You know he doesn't. He, you know he's not going to submit someone like Jacare or Lovato from the bottom. There was the intrigue there, but I don't have to sell it to you now because it's probably not happening. Um, Petr Yan has signed uh, another four-fight deal, which is great because he was looking great against um, Dion Drage the other night. And uh, he's already signed to fight John Dodson next, which is a very interesting stylistic matchup. Because, as we said, Petr Yan is uh, pressure and straights. Straight hitting gets boxers plums. And John Dodson is about running sideways and doing straights. You know, that very boring style he's adopted lately where he runs out the side door and doubles or triples the right straight or the left straight, depending on what stance he's in. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if, if Petty Ann can cut him off with the round kicks and the left hook. And if he can't, it'll be nice to get angry at John Dodson for being so boring again. 
Elsewhere, Jorge Masvidal, or George Masvidal, whatever he is, uh, called out Darren Till for UFC London. UFC London recently announced a co-main event, which obviously near the time they'll move up to be the real main event, because that's what happens for UFC London every year. Um, but yeah, this is news for some reason. I don't know why. Um, Jorge Masvidal calls out everyone and very rarely fights. But I'd enjoy that fight. But then Darren Till was supposed to be going to middleweight. So who knows? And then finally, final depressing piece of news. Brad Pickett is set to make his comeback to bare knuckle boxing. Um, Because if your problem was that you weren't very good at striking and you were getting knocked out lots towards the end of your career, definitely best to come back into a pure form of boxing. Oh, dear. He's doing great work as a coach down at Titan M. Uh, what is it? Titan fighting? Titan fight? Tighty White? No, uh, yeah, he's got. A, uh, he's working with Nathaniel Wood and loads of guys like that. Um, so I don't know why he needs to come back, but obviously just that competitive drive never leaves you, I suppose. Anyway, let's talk about the fights going on this weekend. So we've moved to ESPN Plus, ESPN Plus One. I think they've numbered the card ESPN Plus One. I don't know. I'm living in the UK. I don't have ESPN. But they decided to headline the card with Cejudo versus... Dillashaw, which is the least anticipated super fight of all time, perhaps, or champion versus champion fight of all time. I like it. It's uh, a pretty good fight. Uh, lots of people still not sold on Cejudo, and lots of people still butthurt about Cejudo beating uh, Dill- uh, not Dillashaw, uh, Demetrius Johnson. Whereas Dillashaw, standing on a bit firmer ground, having uh, starched Cody Garbrandt twice, beaten Rafael Sansao, beaten John Lineker recently. Yeah, I-, I think a lot of people are looking at this seeing... Dillashaw has taken shots from much harder hitters and bigger men, uh, is the bigger fighter, can wrestle very, very well, and uh, has knockout power in both hands too. Whereas Cejudo has had showings of decent power, but, you know, the Wilson Hayes one was the sort of perfect fight where Wilson Hayes was just walking straight into all the things that Cejudo was trying. Um... Pettis did, uh, you know, much better on the feet, but obviously was taken down quite easily and held down. Uh, and then Demetrius Johnson was off put by Cejudo, threatening the counter punches and circling to the, uh, spiraling to the inside of the lead leg uh, and threatening counter punches. And for a little while, Demetrius Johnson was a little bit tentative, uh, and then he realised that uh, Cejudo wasn't going to do anything about like the low kicks, uh, so he just kept low kicking. I always focus on that Wilson Hayes fight because it was just so good, but I, I think it's you know probably unfair. To... Well, I suppose it's not unfair. It's it's the best possible outcome for Cejudo in that fight. That Wilson Hayes did just keep following him and trying to throw punches after him. Um, Cejudo has adopted that like wider stance. He's now the karate hottie, uh, karate hottie. That's how they say it in America. Uh, <laughs> but he he does that like slowly drifting towards the inside of your lead leg from an open guard. So he'll fight southpaw or orthodox, and you'll fight orthodox or southpaw, and he'll. Uh, go opposite to you and he'll circle towards the inside of that lead leg uh, and as you step in chasing him with with your rear hand he'll try and come back with counters Uh, and if you're just sort of following him around he'll turn you and then as you turn that lead foot is planted so you can step outside it with the knee or with the uh, right straight or I suppose the left straight if he's on the other side basically it's, it's circling to the inside of that lead leg making the opponent turn and then, you know, you can look for those nice uh, counters drifting off to the inside, or the open side counter, we call it, drifting off to that side and uh, coming back over the top of the opponent's rear hand with your own rear hand. Or you can just use the turning to keep turning them. And if you're turning to face someone who's moving, who's drifting off to your power side, you're normally turning around your lead leg. Especially if you're out in the open and you're not a good ring cutter and you're not trying to put pressure on them. Uh, you're turning around your lead leg, which means your lead leg's planted, which means if they're drifting well, they've got time to step back in outside your lead leg and take the angle for the straight or the knee, uh, or a nice body kick. Simple stuff and something that you can play with pretty effectively um, if you're comfortable getting to it. Well, I mean, you can play with it against southpaws if you're an orthodox, but if you're comfortable going to southpaw, you can play with it against uh, orthodox fighters. And it's really nice. It's it's allowed him to do more hitting than he used to. He used to do a lot of... Well, I, I found him really tedious to watch back in the day when he was wearing those gold shorts because he'd, like, Superman punch, low kick, takedown attempt, Superman punch, low kick, takedown attempt. And you're going, 
this guy is always talking about how much boxing he's doing and all he ever does is Superman punch. Uh, by taking that step back, lengthening the stance out, drawing the opponent towards him, he's giving himself more opportunities to not only hit cleanly, but to hit in combination, or rather counter combination. And that's um, handy. That's really handy. <laughs> like, you know, it's one thing to hit mitts every day for like six years, but if you can't actually get the opponent to stand in front of you, then you're not going to be able to land those nice combinations on them. Obviously, the Cejudo takedown, the, the great Cejudo takedown that we all know is the inside trip because he hit it on uh, Demetrius Johnson in the first fight and that was like his big, big success and Johnson immediately got up. And then he used it in the second fight, managed to hold him down a little bit more. Johnson was really good with the Grambies. Um, I, you know, as someone who hasn't been on board the Demetrius Johnson is just so much better than any fighter who's ever lived train, I thought that was one of Johnson's best performances in that uh, second fight because he was presented with someone who had answers and was asking him strange questions that he hadn't encountered before rather than someone where his whole game was just better so he could do whatever you know um which has been the case of most of demetrius johnson's title fights of course the weird part of this whole fight is that dillashaw was going down to 125 to do it which was something he uh was throwing out there when they were trying to get that demetrius johnson fight together um because Johnson wanted to set the record or whatever it was in title defenses first. And he said, I'll come down to 25. And Johnson said, well, you better take a fight at 25 before you fight me because I don't want you missing weight, um, which I suppose is fair enough. But also, if you're TJ Dillashaw, why would you waste time fighting some flyweight contender? Because any flyweight contender, no one's ever heard of. So, you know, you're, D you're uh, TJ Dillashaw and you're going down to fight John Moraga or something like that. It's not really worth your time, especially if you're main eventing cards and drawing in more interest than uh, than Johnson every time um, so that's where that whole thing reached an impasse now that Cejudo's champion he's still doing this going down to 125 and presumably that's because Dillashaw wants both belts you know I you could get both belts on the poster without him going down to 125 just have them on the you know the poster could be exactly the same but um, the fight is actually for the flyweight championship not the bantamweight championship which is extremely strange in these like you know one man it's almost always the, the smaller man going up in these fights um or has been recently <laughs> so we don't know how dillashaw's body's going to deal with the cut he's you know everyone always claims they can do it and then they don't <laughs> they, they always say oh this this cut takes nothing out of me i'm actually in the best shape of my career and then you get in reports like five days out that they're 20 pounds over or something like that um Whereas Cejudo is looking bigger than ever. He's packing on weight to fight a bigger fighters. <laughs> so you're thinking, could this be end up being a catchweight fight? Could they just... If people are speculating like this will be the first time where two champions uh, or two fighters both in a title fight miss weight in the UFC. Um, but the interesting thing is that if you did that, could you then make it catchweight at 129 or whatever? Or just open it up as a bantamweight title fight and say the limit's 135 and neither of them will get up, well, I mean, they'll get up there after rehydrating, but you won't have to do anything about it, which would be fascinating and hilarious. That would be the most fascinating and hilarious part of this fight for most people. I suppose what interests me about this fight is that while TJ's bigger, you know, he doesn't have the same wrestling accomplishments and pedigree that Cejudo does. Gold medal, take a drink. Um... So that's interesting, but Cejudo doesn't do an awful lot of shooting out in the open against his better opponents. A lot of it's like f continuing to strike, and then when they fall into the clinch, he'll immediately hit the inside trip or something like that to, you know, just um, just one of those things that he's super practiced in. But in the course of the fight, he's not forcing it as much nowadays. Um, though he did, he did pursue the takedown against Pettis. But then Pettis is the ideal opponent for Cejudo because when he finds himself in a bad position, he won't do anything about it. He'll just be like, ah, I can live with this for the rest of the round. <laughs> I'll make it up in the next round despite never having stopped anyone in the UFC. So, you know, it's inter it'll be interesting to see if he can do anything clever to take Dillashaw down. It'll be interesting to see how Dillashaw's strength is affected by cutting to, to 125. Um, you know, we're thinking of him as the bigger man, but honestly, they could both come in, uh, you know, similar uh bulk and then the other interesting thing is that dillashaw's worst fight the one against uh dominic cruz which was a, a terrific fight it's by no means his worst fight in terms of entertainment value um but what he really struggled with was chasing dom uh and then when dom was put in against cody garbrandt and he was made to chase cody garbrandt he really struggled there 
Um, a lot of these guys are, especially the guys with lots of movement, are better when the opponent's coming towards them. Cody Garbrandt does do a lot of chasing, uh, so that was why it was so weird to see him leave the sort of like running and blitz people style just for that one fight. That one fight, game plan of the year 2016 in the Slackies, one of the best performances against a champion I've ever seen, especially by someone who was so uh, so far the underdog, but they never fought like that again. <laughs> it's just so strange. Uh, but if you watch TJ versus Cruz, he does an awful lot of chasing. And Cruz can do those like backstepping hooks and things. Uh, and because TJ's trying to shift and punch at the same time, he's just running onto these hooks face first. Um, I think TJ's at his worst when he's pursuing rather than circling around and popping in and out. And TJ's best moments in that fight came firstly uh, when he made uh, Cruz come to him. He clipped him with a good a couple of counter hooks and then Cruz immediately got back on his bike and TJ was chasing him again um or when he low kicked well like when he went for it when he went for it off combinations and setups or on the counter and things like that when he was just kicking naked a lot of the time uh Cruz was catching it and just taking him down off it because don't forget like whether you're a good wrestler or not if you kick and your kick gets caught especially low kicks which are like right by the you know they they glide up towards the hip if you hit the thigh you're giving the opponent your leg, which is half of the battle in wrestling, you know, not giving the opponent your leg. So with Henry Cejudo's recent, uh, you know, gravitating towards that bringing the opponent to him style, I think that's going to be interesting. I think you might get some surprises on the feet there um, with how cautious he's looked. However, there is still that glaring refusal to deal with, I'll say, of low kicks that was in the... Uh, Johnson fight. He's he's fighting in this nice long stance. He's bouncing forward and back. He's using movement well, but when you're in that long stance, that lead leg's out there. You know, it's the last thing to leave range, and it's it's always going to be there. And if the opponent just throws half fast feints with his hands and gets you backing up, he can sprint into a kick and punt your leg out. You know, Shogun Machida style or Demetrius Johnson Henry Cejudo style. <laughs> so I'm cautiously intrigued by that fight. I'm going to write something on it later in the week. I'm. This So far this week, I've focused really on um, writing about uh, Hernandez versus Cerrone, which is exciting, and Yancy Medeiros versus Gregor Gillespie. I think those are the two interesting ones, because you've got two kind of young guns coming out, or, or trying to come out, uh, into uh, b against bigger names. Vink Pichel was a, a good fighter, but um, that was Gillespie's last opponent, sorry, to, to catch you up. It was a step up in competition, but also sort of not. Yancy Medeiros is, is fascinating because he has had a lot of stumbles against the highest level competition he's fought, but he's also beaten some really good guys. You know, he beat Cowboy Oliveira at welterweight, um, was on a three-fight winning streak, uh, and then I think, he, yeah, he met Cerrone in his most recent one. Cerrone's probably fought like five times since then, um, but he his last fight was against Donald Cerrone, and now he's coming back down to lightweight again to fight Gillespie. Uh, so it's interesting because... Yancy Medeiros does have some nice weapons which could really bother Gillespie and certainly none of Gillespie's previous opponents uh, have shown him very well. Um, but equally, there's always that big wrestling thing. You know, Yancy Medeiros hasn't fought an awful lot of great wrestlers. Alex Oliveira, a uh, very good takedown artist, you know, just a mauling big guy, but not like an accomplished amateur wrestler. I'm going to write something, like I said, I'm going to write something extensive on Gregor Gillespie uh, or I have something in the works at the moment. Um, really interesting character uh the best fisherman in mma but what i like about him is that he tries to establish a jab and threaten the level change and he does this like shoulder feint where his shoulder go he moves like forward and down so it looks like both a jab and a level change um and he draws a, a reaction and then he'll try and throw off that uh his first guy was it franca uh rocked him with the right hand off that like he fainted franca reached back for him and then he came back with a left hook right hand and then who was it he knocked out um was it holbrook uh yeah he, he hit him with a he fainted drew a reaction hit him with the right hand and then he fainted again drew another reaction and hit him with a left hook while he was throwing back uh, same thing twice in a row So a very basic striker, you know, his, against Franca, he was very uh, deer in the headlights early on. Franca came out. Firstly, some of these dudes are fucking huge compared to Gillespie. Franca was gigantic uh, and he was stuck on the end of Franca's reach for the early going. And he's just pumping these jabs out trying to do something. And luckily, Franca walks onto one and stumbles. <laughs> um, 
But he does try and establish that jab, not in like a an educated jab sort of way, not in a clever way, but just sort of any time we come close, I'm going to pump my jab at his face and try and parry whatever comes back with my right hand. And it works, you know, it sets up the level changes and it sets up the feints and it sets up the, the combinations and counters that he comes off that with. And I say combinations and counters, it's normally left hook, right hand or right hand, left hook. As a grappler, he's very entertaining because he keeps a high pace, grinds on dudes, and then he'll drag him down pretty much any which way he can. Uh, and Franca, like in the first round, he gets a body lock, shucks his way to the back and just pulls him down into like a crab ride, you know, pulling the guy down on top of you. Dangerous, because if you don't have a good grip or if he's sweaty or something like that and on the body lock uh, and he just turns into your guard, that's not good. But really interesting grappler does a lot of uh, like half guard passing, as you expect from a wrestler. You know, guys love that shoulder of justice smash, uh, cut knee cut through, um, does a lot of body lock stuff. And really good at taking the mount. If you watched him against um, Rinaldi, uh, or Forrest Griffin Jr., as I call him because of his weird upper body. He's got Forrest Griffin's upper body on, like, featherweight legs. <laughs> but uh, he was using really nice uh, foot pummeling and, and windshield wiper stuff to get to mount. Threaten mount, take away the mount, go back to mount. Yeah, he leaves mount momentarily and goes back to mount uh, once he's improved his foot positioning. Um, or rather, it, taken away Rinaldi's attempt to get guard back. Good at taking the back. Guys turn their back on him uh, when he mounts them and then they realise, no, I'd, I'd rather turn back into him. Uh, he does a uh, really good... Well, firstly, his, he's got a number of arm triangles uh, on his record. And the arm triangle is nice because it's what it r really suits sort of like head down pressure passes sort of guys. Um, and it really works well when guys bridge into you and lose track of that elbow because you can shoot your head and ideally like shoulder to or well, not shoulder but as much of your head under their arm as possible and start driving it up you can also get it off the back as he does quite often or, or threatens to when he's on the back guys will start turning into him and he'll try and turn into mount while keeping that elbow and trying to drive it up into an arm triangle he got Ronaldo with that and he got um Vink Pichel with that too um he's you know f uh never been beaten 12 fight winning streak five fight winning streak in the UFC four fight finishing streak and just incredibly exciting his fight against Gonzalez who again was fucking gigantic compared to him absolutely fantastic but highlighted that the guy is by no means um the kind of guy that we're like oh my god who can stop this guy because <laughs> he was getting lit up in that fight like the uppercut was really troubling him uh Gonzalez was, was southpaw he was throwing high kicks and then they were smacking Gillespie's arm into his head you were going Jesus that's close maybe maybe put that arm a little bit further out and just keep it there for safety um and then when uh Gillespie shot Gonzalez was timing the uppercut well at one point he times the uppercut and Gillespie sort of stops shooting forward and falls onto his knees and has to try and uh, you know that was sort of like controlled implosion collapse that guys do and then had to try and scramble from his knees to, to pick up the takedown oh no it was, it was Gonzalez the arm triangle no he smashed um Ronaldi with ground and pound but the cool leg stuff was in the Ronaldi fight um so yeah I'm very excited to see him what I think that um Yancey might be able to do against him is firstly that front kick to the body if you watched um the Oliveira fight it was a jack slack brawl <laughs> it's exactly what I like it was back and forth both beating the shit out of each other but with front kicks <laughs> they're both just trading front kicks to the body and I'm going oh yes Front kick to the midsection, really going to mess up ability to get in uh, if, if it's timed well, and it, you know, uh, from a southpaw stance. Madero switches, if I remember correctly, so yeah, that'll be interesting. Uh, the uppercut on the level change is, uh, you know, obviously important. Seeing how Madero's uh, wrestling holds up coming back down to lightweight will be interesting. And if he can just use distancing to keep Gillespie off the shot, Gillespie's not the kind of, like, Chelson and dive on the shot from miles away kind of fighter he does well or you know he does a good job of jab 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 right hand or whatever and then just bending at the knees and going in you know he's not diving after people's legs most of the time so that's one of my ones to watch Joseph Benavides versus Dustin Ortiz that's interesting Joseph Benavides looked so much better in his last fight than he did in the previous one against Sergio Pettis it was like he'd forgotten how to do everything against Sergio Pettis it was really strange um so yeah, that'd be interesting. You got the, well, Tapology has him as number two flyweight versus number seven flyweight in the world. Wait, what are we doing with um, Demetrius Johnson if uh, Benavidez is number two? 
Oh, wow, Demetrius Johnson's down at number four because he's scheduled to fight some nobody in uh, one. And Jussia Formiga is at number three, uh, based off backpacking a very unurgent uh, Sergio Pettis. Paige Van, Va- uh, Paige Van Zandt versus Rachel Ostovich. This combined with the co-main event of Greg Hardy versus Alan Crowder is what's got people up in arms. Ostovich obviously victim of domestic abuse. Paige Van Zandt obviously victim of sexual abuse as a uh, um, school age person. Greg Hardy obviously beater of women, uh, as far as I can remember. That's what I was saying that uh, on his uh, pre-fight stuff, he keeps referring to the thing that happened to him rather than the thing that he did. Oh, what is it I always say about him? There's that Hemingway quote. Oh, the eyes of an unsuccessful rapist. That's the one. He's got these big, creepy, sad eyes. Um, he's fighting Alan Crowder, who's number 79 at the world in the world at heavyweight, which puts him below Geronimo Dos Santos. So that is where we call him a scrub. If you can't beat Geronimo Dos Santos, you're a scrub. Um, so that's, you know, getting Greg Hardy either knocked out or knocking a dude out uh, on TV. And then the gift goes up on Reddit. That's what's going to happen. Oh, I was mistaken. Sorry, it was Ion Kutalaba who was taken off the card, not uh, Glover Teixeira, because Glover Teixeira currently matched against Carl Robertson uh, or Robertson, um, who, oh, oh, there you go. He's ranked at middleweight. So <laughs> that's what you do when you can't find light heavyweight, get a middleweight at short notice. Uh, Joanne Calderwood versus uh, Ariane Lipsky. Fair enough. Um, you know, J- JJ still getting taken down the same way but uh, triangle the ge- a girl, so she's fixed the problem now. Is is how a lot of people reacted. Um, I love Jojo, but she is kind of similar to Pedro Munoz. Just no, she can't move fast enough. <laughs> like, there's, there's there's no pop to anything. Well, at least Pedro Munoz when he when he hits dudes, it feel it looks heavy. Um, but Calderwood does like very slow step up front kicks. You know, very slow elbows and things like that. I don't know if she always looked like that, but she just has this very slow gait in her movement. Um, getting across to the cage towards opponents. Uh, if she had a really good jab, she'd be slaying bitches down at um, straw weight or flyweight where she is now. But then who the fuck else is there to fight at flyweight? So, you know, keep at it and I'm sure you'll get a shot at uh, Valentina soon enough. Especially with uh, Joanna teasing a move to 1FC. Jesus Christ. Um, Alonso Middenfield versus Vicious Alves. Yeah. Light heavyweight, that's why we don't care about that. Corey Sandhagen. I think I've heard something about this guy. I think people keep posting it on my fucking Facebook wall to get on the Corey Sandhagen Express. Uh, he's now fighting Mario Bautista, uh, which is obviously... Uh, while Bautista, Bautista is... Uh, or Bautista, whatever you want to call him, is, is 6-0, and it's obviously not John Lineker. So really this is just to get Sandhagen um, his, his pay, his purse, because obviously it's very unfortunate that he's lost the fight with John Lineker. That would have been huge for him because John Lineker was previously matched against Demi- uh, Dominic Cruz. So he had two dropouts in this fight and it's now not the original fight at all. He was originally matched against Dominic Cruz and they were going to push Dominic Cruz back into title contention. Wow, De- Dennis Bermudez is well far down this card versus Tay Edwards, but Tay Edwards is 6-2 and two and Do- Dennis Bermudez is good. <laughs> so that's a weird one. But it is at lightweight, and Dennis Bermudez is pretty much known as a featherweight, so interesting. Bilal Muhammad versus Jeff Neal. Um, yeah, that's good. Chance recounter, a chance encounter, no, chance rencounter versus Kyle Stewart. Um, I haven't really heard much about either of those lads. Uh, let's go back up. What have we got? What did we miss? Oh, Don Cerrone versus Alexander Alexander Hernandez. That's the one I was going to get on about. Uh, I'm having an interesting time studying Hernandez because I'd seen the fight with Benil Dariush and I was like, this lad comes out a mile a minute or starts switches, lovely stuff, and a knockout. Um, Then he fights Olivia Aubin-Mercier and just sort of leans on him the entire time. (laughs) The DC was going, he's driving a high pace here, a high pace. And he's like, well, he's driving a constant pace. He's just sort of driving his shoulder into him most of this fight. Um... That was a good fight. There was a really nice sweep in that where um, he had uh, Oban Mercier in his butterfly guard and Oban Mercier swung a punch. He slipped under it, came up on like the octopus guard and uh, Oban Mercier sort of butt flopped to try and turn it into a half guard back sort of backstepping sort of pass uh, and ended up giving his back, which was really nice. The thing I don't like about Hernandez is that he's so keen on switching stances that he does it a lot while he's marching straight forward. And I think that's, well, I've seen that get him in trouble. He got caught with some counter hooks against Oban Mercia, but they were just sort of arm punches. Uh, he did get dropped to his knees briefly in the third round of that. But I feel like he looked 
I mean, Oban Mercier is a big lad, um, lightweight, but he was a bit smaller than Oban Mercier. He looks small in that fight. And he's going to be fighting Donald Cerrone, who's like the, the biggest of lightweights. Um, so he's going to be giving up some height and reach, I imagine, or at least height and range. Um, I'm wondering, because the whole thing with Cerrone, we all know, get in his face. That's the thing he hates. Um, but he does have that nice knee and some nice elbows and good clinch work, which could all slow uh, Hernandez down. He's also very, very good on the ground, very underrated on the ground. Um, I think it'd be interesting to see. I think I'd like to see Hernandez stand back and try and pick at him a bit and then try and work his way in on the, uh, you know, if you can draw the step out, uh, step up. Uh, lead leg kick out of Cerrone, which you can because he loves it. He throws it to the head against orthodox fighters and to the lead leg against southpaw fighters. But if you can draw that out of him, you can step up the middle and crack him with a punch and try and swarm on him. Um, and then, you know, if he's doing well on the feet, I'd say anticipate the shot because the Donald Cerrone shot is lazy. Uh, it's just sort of like head down and walk forwards. Um, and uh, Leon Edwards was completely prepared. Well, I gave Leon Edwards game plan of the year because everything that Donald Cerrone does, he had an answer for. And he just clamped down on the wizard, got his head in front of Cerrone's, kneed him in the gut, elbowed on the break. Beautiful stuff. Uh, so, you know, be interesting to see what Hernandez can do there. Big step up in competition. We we assume that Donald Cerrone's best days are behind him, but he, he fights so often that he'll always lose one eventually. Um... You know, he lost to Leon Edwards, who was really on point in that fight, and he lost to Darren Till, who was, again, really on point in that fight. But he's also beaten guys very recently, like, well, Alex Oliveira wasn't that recently, but Yancy Medeiros, Mike Perry, you know, a much bigger, stronger hitter than um, Hernandez. He had that good back and forth with Robbie Lawler. Um, but yeah, no, God, he's only won two in the last uh, year or so, because... Uh, yeah, go, dating back to that Masvidal loss, but he fought uh, Matt, uh, Matt Brown, Rick Story. The Rick Story one was awesome, um, Patrick Cote. So he's fought a lot of old dudes, actually. Since that Alex Oliveira one, it's fought a lot of old timers. You know, Matt Brown, Rick Story had one foot out of the door already. Patrick Cote is just sort of lingering. Um, Masvidal, young guy, but kicked the crap out of him. Robbie Lawler, old guy, nice even back and forth fight. Darren Till, young up and comer, smashed him. Yancy Medeiros, not really on the level as in on the level of Donald, uh, Donald Cerrone, and, and uh, Cerrone beat him. And then Leon Edwards, young up-and-comer, game plan for him perfectly. I think it, what you're seeing now is, I mean, someone told me that Till read all my stuff on uh, Cerrone before the uh, before he fought Cerrone. But I think Cerrone, by fighting as often as he has, he's got a really well-documented career. You know, you can watch everything that Cerrone's ever done and look at, and it, the other thing is that he doesn't really change a lot of what he does, even when it's failing him or getting him into trouble. So he's got the same sort of weaknesses he's always had and the same sort of things he goes for uh, as he always has. You know, he very rarely shows new looks. So you can prepare for all his favorite techniques like that step up lead leg kick. Um, Leon Edwards going straight down the center on that every time as was Darren Till you can prepare to push him straight back get in his face with straight punches um, and, and you know you just and the, the shot that always comes eventually with the head down so he's so well documented I think he's going to have a really hard time against like the modern generation of fighter who's coming up being prepared to fight him really but again I, I could see Cerrone taking this one because I think Hernandez if he fights mobile like he did against Dariush in the first, well, the few seconds of that fight where he's moving around a lot, I think he's got a better chance. But if he's coming straight in, I think knees, front kicks to the body, uh, elbows on the break and things like that from Cerrone are going to give him real trouble. And I don't think he's going to be able to like press Cerrone to the fence and keep dragging his butt out for those short double legs like he did against Obi Mercia. I mean, Obi Mercia, big strong grappler, but not particularly active off his back. Though he did hit a wicked Kimura in that fight to turn the, uh, to turn Hernandez over onto bottom but anyway yeah so good good looking fights coming up uh this weekend on the ufc and then on one uh their flyweight champions fighting so keep up with that because uh he will probably be fighting demetrius johnson soon whatever his name is let's do a couple of questions and then we'll get out of here for this week dear the slackiest of jacks first off huge fan and thanks for all the work you do your youtube channel and podcast have helped me in uh, a few of my fights so thanks a bunch for your solid work i have two questions for you one, I recently watched a, f a seminar of Fedor and he talks about using only torso throws for takedowns because it's more energy efficient and safer. Uh, second, I have been using uh, Ryan Hall's 50-50 shot in combination with a high crotch. I think he means like an upside down shot. Um, 
What are your thoughts on using these two as part of a series? Apologies if this doesn't make any sense. I'm a fighter and I've never learned how, how to English good. Uh, thanks again for your work, my man. Cheers, Patrick. P.S. Can you make Corey Sandhagen one of your boys? If he lands another good liver shot, he's in there for sure. Yeah, it's always interesting seeing Guy's um, philosophy on saving energy and things like that. Like Marcelo Garcia one of the greatest grapplers of all time, doesn't believe in Kimuras. Like he, you know, the Kimura as a control is a huge part of the modern grappling game. But he's just like, nah, I don't like Kimuras. It's a strength move. And you're like, I respect your opinion so much, Marcelo, but I cannot, why are you calling it a strength move, man? Um, but then he did get finished by a closed guard Kimura by uh, Jacare back in the day. Um, which I suppose the closed guard Kimura in that case was a bit of a strength move because Jacare is like twice the size of him. Um, uh, but he also believes in never taking a uh, guillotine with the arm in and so on. Um, whereas I've heard of guys who prefer the guillotine with the arm in because you can um, limit the opponent's defensive options in terms of where that hand can go. Um, and, you know, I'm, the reason I brought up Marcelo is because Marcelo believes uh, mainly in wrestling takedowns, even in the gi. Uh, whereas Fedor believes in judo style takedowns without the gi. Uh, whereas wrestling takedowns are really more common without the gi. Um, I think it gives you a real advantage if you're good with your judo. Obviously, not everyone can be Ronda Rousey and just take a headlock and you know, how I go she people and go straight to the finish. But Fedor was so good with his hips and just chaining throw attempts and things like that, that the act of threatening to throw someone would make them loosen their arms on a body lock and then he could come back with the left hand or whatever. You know, the, he stunned Krokop with uh, a... Uchimata and then immediately came back with the uppercut and he was so good with his hips that like Ogata no, not Ogata Ogawa uh, the ju judo gold medalist for Japan got double underhooks on him and Fedor threw him like tripped him to mount uh, from there so uh, the the other thing about Fedor is that anytime he was in the clinch there was very little resting he was always trying shit always attempting to throw dudes and while that's very labor intent you know what I say he says to save energy but um, well I suppose if you if if you practice that since day one and you're very good at doing that um, turn in and trying to throw, uh, you can do it as many times as you want in the fight, I suppose. It's an interesting thing because, you know, I can see guys... You, if you watch the Gillespie... Uh, the Gillespie one's fresh in my head, Gillespie versus Franca. When he shoots uh, and he's a little bit desperate, he takes these shots from wide out in the open and gets stuffed and it looks like he's using so much energy to do it. And this is one of the better wrestlers in the UFC. Read the Ryan Hall upside down shot in combination with a high crotch. I can't quite see what you're talking about. Um, I'm imagining you go for the high crotch across the body and the opponent withdraws the leg or something. I don't know. I like the high crotch. Um, it's it's actually really catching on with leg lockers generally. Uh, there were a couple of entries that John Danaher released on his DVDs. I've seen a few guys using the high crotch to enter on the legs in like the Ashigarami style. Um, whereas... Uh, it, tended to be that grappling guys shied away from the high crotch because you know your guys used to be worried about the switch or the um crucifix benson henderson immediately came out and uh high crotch attempted uh rodolfo vieira who obviously is like twice the size of bendo but he immediately went to the crucifix and, and uh made bendo's life hell um but you're seeing more and more in mma just the applicability even when those techniques are available to the opponent if you keep the if you keep him off balance and you keep moving him around, you, you know you can make it very hard for him to do that. Uh, but it also flows really well into the leg lock game if you go for the leg and you go under them. It'd be interesting to see someone go for a high crotch and then sh uh, go upside down towards the opposite leg, which would be the same sort of principle that um, John Smith used to use. John Smith famous for the low single, but he developed the low single because he used to go like high crotch on the opponent's lead leg. So like say the left leg's forward, he'd reach across and try and get the high crotch. And dude started just hiding that leg from, from him constantly. So he'd reach for the high crotch and then immediately shoot low on the other leg. Uh, I suppose you could do the same if you went all the way through and turned upside down. That would be interesting. Um, but yeah, feel free to send me a video of that because I would like to copy it <laughs> or whatever you're doing with your uh, 50, uh, high crotch to 50-50 or 50-50 to high crotch. Hi Jack, in Gary Tonnen's latest MMA fight against Sung Jong Lee, he passes butterfly guard by posting both hands on, uh, on the mat above the opponent's head and passing by moving his unweighted legs and hips. Is there a name for this specific type of passing strategy and has it be, been used in uh, MMA effectively before? Keep up the great work from Joe. Um, nowadays, 
as in this week, we're calling it Floating Passing because Gordon Ryan's about to release a DVD on uh, Guard Passing. I did something on Gordon Ryan a little while ago. It was sort of like his matches from the uh, Nogi Worlds I was using as a, a basis for this study. But his passing has already has always interested me uh, because of this position. He does the, like, he'll get to sort of headquarters position, have the one knee jutting out to cut down the other, opponent's other leg, uh, and then he'll put his hands on the on the mat and float his hips over their hips. Uh, and, you know, if they're not staying rigid, he can just sort of flop into a, a side smash. But if they do stay rigid, he can pummel his feet and start moving up that way. Um, his fight, his match, sorry, with uh, Zande is an interesting one for that one. Oh, Zanje, rather. There's a lot of interesting examples of that. But, yeah, there's a couple of good studies out on that. Um, some tall guy from, is it Long Island Top Team with Rob Bianecki? Um but yeah, he put up a, a a series of them that he's been working on. I like the pass. I've been working on just the sort of like windshield wiper pass. Um, lots of options off it. And one of the important things, one of the reasons that the Danaher guys do it is because it's an application of the foot pummeling stuff that you'll do if you're hunting leg locks constantly. And because it's a good way of shutting down the opponent's um, ability to, to shoot through for an Ashigarami, a, a leg entanglement. If you've got one leg in the center all the time, he has to bring one leg in to shoot through for the Ashigarami. But yes, very much looking forward to that uh, DVD coming out. BJJ Fanatics, if you want to send me a freebie, please do. Greetings, Jack. The Kevin Hart of Fighting Smart. Big fan of your work and your podcast. Insert appropriate amount of buttering here. I live in Norway and the level of striking here is not the best. I mean, look at Emil Meek. <laughs> harsh. Harsh, man. Um, do you have any tips on how to improve slash train slash train as a, as a striker in an environment with low quality of organized training? Also, any tips on short stocky strikers would be massively appreciated. Kind regards, a big fan also named Jack. As someone who doesn't rate themselves as a high-level striker to begin with, um, you know, I'm not going to tell you how you can become a high-level striker, but I am going to say it is entirely possible. Look at uh, Anderson Silva, you know, fought, uh, trained at shootbox the entire time, came out with a completely different style from the dudes he was around. And a lot of that was, um, you know, that, that really started to show, uh, to become more obvious when he left shootbox. But... For someone to come out of shootbox with that technical style when everything in shootbox was geared towards the, the mauling and brawling sort of style um, tells you that if you're working on something and you're consciously trying to fight a certain way, you can probably do it. I just say if you want to be more technical, work on, the stuff to work on in the, in the meantime is like get a slip bag, get a double end bag or whatever, work on your head movement. Make sure you're always moving ahead in your uh, shadow boxing and imagining where your opponent's going to be, moving your feet well, working on your defense and so on. Um, and all that stuff will pay off when you, you you can then test that in sparring. Because you're sparring, unless you're, your coach is working with you like specifically for a fight and he's got someone in there with you and you're, he's giving you advice and making the other guy do certain things to, to work on something with you, uh, unless that's the case... Your the sparring is basically your time to work on whatever you want, or rather work on what you're faced with from uh, whoever you're training with. Um, so it's like BJJ. One of the things that everyone comes out with a different style in BJJ, even if they're training at a school full of like great butterfly guard players, and then they suddenly like uh, you know, Gianni Grippo is one of Marcelo Garcia's black belts. Doesn't play any butterfly guard. Plays a ton of De La Hiva guard, which Marcelo Garcia doesn't do at all. But it's because. The emphasis on sparring in BJJ allows you to develop on your own, you know, against other people and against what they're doing rather than in the same way as other people and what they're doing. Um, so, yeah, just I'd say w work on what you want to do in your shadow boxing and your uh, bag training and, and so on, and then apply it in sparring. If you're doing it good, coaches won't complain. And if you're doing it bad, the coach will tell you how to do it better, probably, or why it's not good. Um, so I just say stick at it and don't be discouraged. Don't don't set yourself up for excuses because a lot of the best fighters who ever lived came from areas where they weren't afforded great training or at least great coaches and, and so on. Right, I reckon that'll take us up to time today. Um, if you want to get in on the Patreon episodes, the most recent one was the Sunny Liston one. I just put up a preview of the an all-consuming need for tea. I think I've got two in the... Well, this, this is what um, they always tell you to say as an amateur mo or like as a... Uh, starting out movie maker you say i have numerous projects in various stages of development because ideas technically are projects <laughs> and they're technically in a stage of development um, but i'm working on both uh, muhammad ali one and a um and the third part of our britain in china series i think i'll probably go with that uh for the next one uh which is the boxer rebellion 
So if you want to get in on that or just support the podcast, sign up to the Patreon. If you have any questions for the podcast, fights gone by podcast at gmail.com. I'm your boy Jack Slack, and it's bloody good to have some fights on again. Cheers!